I'd like to say good morning to my brothers and sisters. Uh, Minister Timothy Robinson here with another study. Uh, we thank God for another opportunity. We pray that as we study together here uh, with this message that you'll be encouraged and being edified and um, enlightened in the Holy Scriptures. We're going to go ahead and get going. Father, we thank you for another opportunity to come and study. We pray as we study together that we as saints in the body of Christ would be edified in your holy word. Thank you for the gospel. And that is that Jesus Christ died, that he was buried, and he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. We thank you for the wonderful good news. In Jesus' name we pray, man. Today we're going to talk about um, walking in the spirit versus walking in the flesh. In Galatians 5, 16 through 17, Paul said, This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that you would. Notice that the things that ye would. This should, this should make it clear that no one escapes the conflict. No one can avoid the struggle uh, between the flesh and the spirit. Uh, flesh may be described as one's mindset of selfish thinking and resulting patterns of behavior. These patterns of behavior are activated when we choose to believe Satan lies and act on our own resources in order to cope with life, solve our problems, or meet our needs. The flesh is always focused primarily on self. Uh, many are in situations you never plan to be in this in life. Paul planned to go to Rome, but not in chains. <clears throat> Maybe you're in a confining situation where you feel bound by chains. It may be difficult, may be a difficult marriage you might be in, um, which you didn't plan on. It may be a family problem. It could be a, a difficult job that you own, be a personal problem over which you have no control, a health problem or a situation that's been thrust into with no choice on your part. Uh, what should you do? Make your change a channel for proclaiming Christ, my brothers and sisters. How? First, you say no to the self-life, uh, to seeking your own way, your own happiness, your own will. Say no to a grumbling, complaining spirit. And then say yes to the gospel as first in your life by understanding and believing it and by proclaiming it, Jesus Christ, in every situation, by your cheerful attitude of trust in him. And as he gives opportunity by your words, a witness, you'll find that by so losing your life for the sake of Christ and the gospel, you'll find true happiness, both for time and for eternity, my brothers and sisters. Are you chained to the flesh? That's a good question. Now, many do not realize how attempts to meet these God-given inner needs drive their behavior. They know something is missing in their life, but they are not sure what it is, <clears throat> how to get it. Sadly, even most Christians are deceiving and believing they are still missing something and that they can get that something by their performance. Does that sound familiar? It should if you read the third chapter in the book of Genesis. That is the lie that Satan implied in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve had everything they needed, but Satan deceived them into believing they were missing something and that they could get that something, in other words, be like God by doing something, eat from the forbidden truth. He is still using that same lie today. He's the great deceiver, my brothers and sisters. We must remember that. He is good at getting many in the body of Christ to step onto the performance treadmill to meet some perceived need, but all they are getting on the treadmill is very tired. Know this, these inner needs are fully met in the person of Jesus Christ. In him, we are complete. Philippians 4, 19, but my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Colossians 2, 10, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. What kind of lifestyle do you think of when you hear someone say a person is living in accordance to the flesh? Does a list like this come to mind? Sexual immorality, impurity, idol idolatry, enmity, strife, jealousy, just to name a few. <clears throat> My brothers and sisters, note this list comes directly from Galatians 5, 19 through 21. And the above list certainly does characterize fleshly living. But there's a different kind of fleshly living 
that is more difficult to spot. Now you consider the following list, circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, or the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law. This is Paul talking to Pharisees, zealous for God and as to righteousness under the law, blameless. You may recognize this list as coming from the apostle Paul. In Philippians 3, 5 through 6, this was Paul's flesh list before he received Christ. Just before he gave this list, this is what he said in Philippians 3, 3 through 4. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh, though I might also have confidence in the flesh. If any other man thinketh that he has whereof might trust in the flesh, I more. Paul said that he could put confidence in the flesh and as a matter of fact, he had four more, my brothers and sisters, he said four more reasons to put confidence in his flesh than anyone else. Paul was saying, hey, I put my flesh resume up against anyone. In his day, Paul's list of accomplishments would have been considered great by most of the nation of Israel. Now look at what Paul said immediately after he recited his flesh list, Philippians 3, 7 through 9. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I suffer the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And he had accomplished, <clears throat> was worthless compared to nothing, to knowing Christ. This is what Paul is saying. What I've accomplished is worthless compared to knowing Christ. What I want you to see is that the flesh can be manifest in many different ways. Paul had had good looking flesh to men. Flesh is controlling when it comes to God to keep him at a distance or to get him to bless me. That's what a lot of think. It keep God at a distance. Example, failure to acknowledge God may occur after being hurt, blaming God for the death of a loved one. Get God to bless me. Example, religious performance, circumstances to keep from being overwhelmed by life situations. Example, you attempt to control every aspect of one's life. My brothers and sisters, let me say this tonight. The flesh serves to keep the real me disguised or hidden from others so they don't see my weaknesses. Many pretend to be someone they are not in order to fit in with those in which they associate with. These disguises can change with whatever they think best meet their needs. Depending on what they are or whom they are with, however, whenever their behavior does not match their identity, there will be conflict within them. The flesh is legalistic. The flesh learns to perform in order to establish an identity. It focuses on doing behavior rather than on being the identity. However, in truth, it is my identity that determines my behavior rather than my behavior determine my identity. The flesh is proud. Whenever someone is functioning according to the flesh, they would exalt self, demand their rights and have difficulty admitting their weaknesses and failures. They would be easily offended and overly concerned with what others think of them. The flesh is addictive. We can become dependent on whatever we believe is working for us, whatever seems to be getting our needs met. Over time, these behaviors and attitudes become strongholds in our lives. And a stronghold is a habitual destructive pattern of behaviors that results from believing a lie or lies of the enemy. My brothers and sisters, these lies and behavior that result are always opposed to the wisdom and the ways of God. A stronghold begins as a faulty thinking, often attacking our, attacking our identity which leads to painful emotion that result in destructive behavior patterns, my brothers and sisters. So consider 2 Corinthians 10, 
Paul said, but I beseech you that I may, I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walk according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, through the pulling down the stronghold, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. The flesh is self-absorbed, self-centered. It view everything through the degree of self. My focus is the focus is on me and my needs. The, the self is self-protective. My image and my reputation are of great importance. I would do whatever I need to do to protect them, including lie, rationalize, blame others, become defensive, deny and justify my actions. I am easy to deceive and have difficulty being objective about myself when you talk about the flesh. What I see as faults in others, I defend in myself. My brothers and sisters, what are you led by? What directs your actions, your decisions, actions, words, and thoughts? As believers, we are called to live by faith. And yet so many of us choose to live by something else, our feelings. Have you ever made a decision because it simply felt right? Have you ever said something because it felt like the perfect moment? I know I have. The Bible is quick to tell us that our feelings or our hearts are more accurately can't be trusted. Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not unto thy own understanding. Proverbs 28, 26, he that trusts in his own heart is a fool, but whosoever walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Living by the certainty of faith. We are called not to live by our feelings, but by faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 tell us, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Our faith is rock solid if we have placed it in God, the unchanging, perfect, eternal, sovereign one. And this faith is found on infallible, certain, life-changing, authoritative word of God. Scripture tells how to live and, and what to believe. This is what should govern and determine how we speak, think, and act, not our ever-changing influence and uh, feelings, easily influenced feelings. Our faith is not blind, but informed and guided by God's perfect word. Sometimes these two can be mixed up. We try to live by both faith and feeling. We often allow our feelings to dictate our stance with God rather than what his word has already declared about us. I don't feel forgiven by God, so he must still be angry with me. I don't feel joy, so I would not worship God. I don't feel God's presence. Even though I had the Holy Spirit living inside of me, I don't feel God when I do my Bible study, so I must be doing something wrong. God calls us to live instead by faith. This means we act not by based on our feelings, but on what God calls us to do. We don't believe something because of how it makes us feel, but what Scripture says about it rightly divided. My brothers and sisters, when you are tempted to listen to your feelings or allow your circumstance to dictate trust in God and his word and walking in the spirit, stop and look to God's word rightly divided. No one gets a Christian life free from outward pressure and inward turmoil. We walk this hard road fighting every day to stay on the right path. Romans 17, 14 through, 20, 14 through 25 explains the Christian is in a struggle against the flesh it is a battle that he will lose at times, but the primary reason for defeat is what he has set his mind on. If he set it on the flesh, then he will obey sin, and it would be his master. If he set it on the spirit, then he will obey righteousness, and it would be his master's. Romans 6, 16, know ye not that whom ye yield yourself, your servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. The problem we often have is that at times we think or feel like we have no choice but to sin. That is simply not true, but it is the reality of how we think and feel at times. The flesh is what we do in our own power, in our own strength, what we can do ourselves, which is legalism. Legalism is anything that we think we can do in order to make 
ourselves more righteous before God. It is human achievement. It is a form of self-righteousness. To walk after flesh is to seek life in terms of what man can accomplish of himself. You can do all kinds of religious things in the flesh. The flesh can preach a sermon. The flesh can show up to every Bible study and church service. The flesh can do these things, but in the eyes of God, it is merely religious activity. Galatians 5, 19 through 21, tell you about all the works of the flesh and how they are manifest. They talk about them, fornication, adultery, just a few, emulations, wrath, strife, my brothers and sisters. Walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh, lust of the flesh. I pray that this message would be encouraging to you and edifying. We thank God for this opportunity. Thank you for another chance to come and have a platform to share your word of truth right divided. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.